Walk around the streets of the Polish city of Gdańsk and you can almost convince yourself that you're not in Eastern Europe at all, but rather further to the west in a city such as Antwerpen or Brugge or Amsterdam. Those long, tall rows of houses stretching along canals with very familiar facades looking out over the water. Yet surely this cannot be. For after all, we are in Poland and not in the Netherlands, which is many miles to the west. But yet, there is some truth in that this city of Gdańsk has rather a lot of Dutchness within its bones. Something that I decided to find out more about in today's video. These connections between Gdańsk and the Low Countries go back all the way to 1358. The city of Gdańsk itself had been founded by Slavic-speaking Poles at some point in the 10th century. Although following this time, various Germanic-speaking orders of knights such as the Teutonic Order would push into the east in an attempt to Christianize the unruly pagans in the Baltic Sea area. It is in 1358 that on the back of this, the city of Gdańsk, or as it was called by these Germans, Danzig, was part of the Hanseatic League, a trading confederation of various cities from the Netherlands and the Low Countries through Germany and indeed around the Baltic, that they worked together to create a profitable trading environment, connecting the goods, especially amber, from the east with those of the west. Not only did this bring trade and prosperity to the city, but also the Low German language. And this is one of the most important connections between the Low Countries and with Gdańsk because this allowed for merchants from several of the cities in the Low Countries to travel and trade in Gdańsk, which we know that they did, particularly in the 15th century with those from the Southern Low Countries, areas of what is today Flemish Belgium, who moved over to Gdańsk and helped to build some of its early infrastructure. We can actually see this with a particular connection between the city of Brugge, known in French as Bruges, and Gdańsk, as in 1379, the Mary Church that is built in the city of Gdańsk or started to be constructed shares many similar features with similar churches in Brugge and other parts of Flanders. For example, the tower of the St. Mary's Church in Gdańsk looks very similar to those in the churches of Doma and Lissevech, as well as the tower of the St. Mary Church, which of course is no coincidence being named the same in Brugge itself. There are further connections. For example, the Hanseatic League's trading post in Brugge, called the Osterling House, meaning the Easterling's House, also pointing to the trade with the Baltic, was built in the late 1470s, and it bears a lot of resemblances with the city hall in Gdańsk's main town, which was built towards the end of the 1480s. It would be from the middle of the 16th century, however, that we would start to seek influence from other parts of the Low Countries as well. The 15th century and early 16th century having been dominated especially by Flemings who came to Gdańsk and built various architectural wonders in the city that resembled those from back home in the flourishing Northern Renaissance. Part of the reason for this influx would be socio-political given the situation in the Low Countries at the time. Another important factor, however, would be religious particularly with a group of the following who followed the teachings of a former Catholic priest from the province of Friesland in the northern Netherlands. He was known in his native Frisian as Menesimens, although he is known more famously to the wider world by his Dutch name of Menno Simons, which gives us, of course, the name of his followers, the Mennonites. These were a type of Anabaptists who believed in a second baptism uh, that had to be chosen by the individual and formed a rather radical strain of Protestantism at the time. 
While they are known, of course, by the Dutch name of the Mennonites, I personally think we should have stuck with the Frisian name and called them the Minions or something similar. That may have been more fun. In any case, although the naming brand was slightly off, we do see that the Mennonites became an important sect in various parts of the Low Countries as well as throughout other parts of the Holy Roman Empire, being transported with the trade from the Low Countries over to Gdańsk itself, where they formed a community in these areas. So we can read, for example, in this article about the Mennonites in Poland that the Mennonites who preferred living in seclusion from the outside world and who earned their living as farmers found an environment that reminded them very much of the northern regions of the Netherlands and Germany they had just left. The settlers were not a homogenous group, and they spoke different languages and dialects, Low Franconian, Low Saxon, and Frisian. In their new country, they settled among people who spoke various Low Germanic German dialects, those being those who had settled there from the Hanseatic League, which must have sounded rather familiar to them. Dutch was preserved as the language used in church for over two centuries, until the end of the 18th century and religious literature for the Mennonites was printed in the Netherlands. For everyday communication, though, the local dialects of the area were soon adopted. This seems that we have a Mennonite community living in Gdańsk already by the start and the middle of the 16th century, although it's hard to document exactly when it began and how large it was. By the end of the 16th century, we definitely have a Mennonite community there. As I mentioned, part of this was for religious reasons, as they were often persecuted against in their home country. Another of the reasons why many Flemings in particular and also other Dutchmen would leave during the 16th and early 17th centuries is because of the war against the Spanish that was being waged there, known later as the Eighty Years' War, which would give birth, of course, to the Dutch Republic in the end. And so it is in the 17th century that the trade with the Hanseatic League cities declines and instead Gdańsk starts to trade even more fruitfully with the Dutch Republic itself. So it was that during the 17th century, on average around 2,000 Dutch merchant ships would dock in Gdańsk every year of the 1600s. Many of those that came to Gdańsk during this time were fleeing from the violence, particularly in the southern Netherlands, following the sack of Antwerpen already in the late 16th century. This meant that those coming from Antwerpen, Dutch-speaking Flemings, often Protestants as well, but not always, came to the northern parts of the Netherlands, this influx of skilled artisans, architects and artists being a major drive towards the Dutch Golden Age that would flourish in the 17th century. Gdańsk would also profit from this exodus of skilled Flemish artists and artisans to the city itself, as many as of them would later on go on Dutch ships to the city and build various monuments in the 17th century. One of those is the green tower that can be seen at the end of the market street, the Dwugi Targ. Here we can see that it has many similarities indeed with the town hall of Antwerpen. And indeed, the man who created it was heavily inspired by the Flemish Renaissance style of architecture. His name was Reiner von Amsterdam, and even though the name indicates where he was from, there was so much cultural mixing with Flanders at this time that it's very likely that he was indeed inspired by the aforementioned building. Another one that is very famous and important to mention about Dutch architecture in Gdańsk is Abraham van den Blokke who in many ways embodies the story of Dutch-Polish connections, as he was actually born in the Baltic in 1572, before moving with his family to Gdańsk in 1584. Abraham followed in the footsteps of his father, Wilhelm von den Blocke, who was also an architect. And in fact, the whole von den Blocke family was incredibly artistically minded in various skill sets, including architecture, sculpture, and indeed painting, as we will see. It's Wilhelm von den Blocke who moved in 1584 to Gdańsk with his young family that would create the Highland Gate, which can still be seen today. His son would be responsible for several of the most iconic buildings and monuments within the city, including the Golden Townhouse, the House of Pelp and Priors, the Golden Gate, and the facade of the Artus Manor House found on the Dwugi Targ. 
The townhouses at 30 and 29 Dwoga Street were also his and number one on Gabbery Street. He was also responsible for overlooking the project of creating the Neptune Fountain, which is found on the famous Bugi Targ. Although he himself didn't sculpt the statue that was done by a fellow Fleming, Peter Hausen. He was commissioned by both king and church. For example, King Sigismund Vasa III ordered him to build the royal granary that was found in the city. Whilst for the St. Mary's Church, which we've already mentioned, he sculpted several of the tombstones and epitaphs that can still be found inside today. He also made the stone altar for the St. John's Church and became a municipal architect in 1611, being very much honoured and revered within the city for his great works that he had done. Abraham's brother Isnak von den Blocke also moved to Dainsk at the same time, probably receiving training and working in the workshop of Paul Fredemann de Vries and his father Hans Fredemann de Vries. He would in 1612 become one of the founders of the Painters Guild in Gdańsk, many similar guilds being found throughout the Low Countries already. Von den Blocke, the painter, would be most famously remembered for his Apotheosis of Danzig, which is a beautiful painting that is found in the old town hall of Gdańsk, which has many details that are very pertinent to the Dutch connection with the city. We see, for instance, uh, up in the very top of the painting that we have a miniature version of the city of Gdańsk as it looked in his time at the beginning of the 17th century. We have the hand of God reaching down and touching the tall tip of the town hall which was also built by fellow Dutchmen already in 1556. We of course see the Tower of Maria Church which resembles those found in various other Flemish cities such as Brugge. We see the Highland Bridge, uh, the Highland Gate that was built by his father Willem von den Blocke at the very front and many other recognizable towers and parts of the city. Lower down, we see some of the people of the city trading with black-hatted merchants, most likely from the Dutch Republic, based on their garb, and others with more traditional Polish-looking hairstyles and hats coming into the city to trade with these merchants. And again, in the background, we see some of the famous gates that can be found throughout Gdańsk in this miniature. On the river, of course, we see the trade that is going out, the flags, which are a bit hard to make out in this image, being red, white, and blue. And so very important connections across with the Low Countries continuing into the 17th century as we find it. A final honorable mention to name is Antoni von Obergen, who was responsible for the design of the old armory, uh, which has really nice decorations. I believe he uh, also employed the help of Abraham von den Blocke for some of these decorations, though it was mainly his own project. This armory would be started around 1600 because it is around this time that the city became threatened from external forces, particularly the Swedish who were looking to expand their empire across the Baltic and who fought against the Poles. Despite the German heritage of Danzig going back with the Hanseatic League, it had come under the rule of the King of Poland, although often functioned semi-autonomously during many of the previous centuries. It was around this time, however, that the Swedes were looking to attack the Kingdom of the Poles, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that is. And so it was necessary for the city of Gdańsk to have its own armory and its own armed forces. This would come in very handy, as in 1627, the Swedish would go to war with the Poles and the city would be blockaded by a Swedish navy. However, luckily for the citizens of Gdańsk and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, help was at hand. And this came from a resident of the city known as Arendt Dickmann, which looks like a very German name, but actually the correct spelling would be Arendt Dijkman, as the captain of the Polish-Lithuanian fleet had been born in Delft and was himself a Dutchman, most of the navy also being made up of mercenaries either from the German-speaking areas but mostly of Dutch sailors and mariners who had a vested interest in keeping the port open to trade with the Dutch Republic. 
So it would be in 1627, the largest naval engagement ever fought by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth would be fought outside the city on the waves at the Battle of Oliva. The battle would result in a resounding Polish-Lithuanian victory over the Swedes and would follow with the blockade being lifted of the city. However, there was a sad note at the end of this battle because the captain, Aaron Degmon, had himself been killed during the fight as a cannonball had gone through his leg. In a procession through the city, his coffin was carried behind several of the captured Swedish mariners and he was laid to rest in the Maria Church, where you can still find his tombstone to this day, as well as many others. Interesting to note when observing these tombstones is that most of them are inscribed in German, even though some of them do have Dutch names as well. There would be a more fighting with the Swedes in 1655 when they once again blockaded the port. This time the Dutch themselves would send a fleet and they would lift the blockade and so continue trade with Gdańsk at this time. A final connection with the Netherlands can be found in the Karel Jong. This is the particular playing of the bells in a small melody as is found throughout most towns in the Netherlands as well. The first Karel Jong to be brought to Gdańsk was in 1561 by Jan Moer. But this connection continued even after the Dutch Golden Age and the 17th century and the decline in trade with the Netherlands. As in 1738, we know that when the Church of St. Catherine's wished to renew its carillon, they sent for a, uh, a maker of the bells, Mikolai Derk, to go to Horen in the Netherlands and there to bring these new carillon bells back to the church that they would sound the same as they had done before. We can still find several of these bells, for example, in the church, and indeed you can still hear the carillon being played through the streets of Gdańsk today. After the 17th century, direct trade with the Netherlands would decline in the city of Gdańsk. And indeed, the architectural influence and the connection with Dutch and Flemish architects coming to the city and building great monuments would also disappear with it. However, of course, the monuments that they built would stand as testament to those connections that had spanned all the way back to the 14th century and the Hanseatic League. However, that isn't the end of the story of the Dutch in Gdańsk, as many of them had actually settled in the city over the years. And there was one community in particular which retained connections with the Netherlands even after the 17th century. I've already talked about them more broadly in this video about the Olenje, as they are called, the Hollanders in Polish, Olenje, that came and lived in various communities in Poland, both in the city of Gdańsk and indeed in the countryside around Gdańsk and various other places where they were responsible for draining marshes and instructing uh, in Dutch farming techniques involving windmills and other such. What's pertinent for the city of Gdańsk, though, is that many of these Mennonites that had come from the Low Country remained in the city and kept a somewhat separate identity over the years. In particular, in Dainz, there were two main branches that could be found. Now, it's quite interesting to see some of the internal politics between this quite mixed group of Mennonite immigrants coming over. So on the one hand, you had a Frisian school of the Mennonite teaching, which was a little bit more liberal. This was in stark contrast to another large group of immigrants from Flanders, the Flemish Mennonite school being more conservative. And so these two branches of the Mennonite church often clashed in the settlements in Poland. 
It's quite interesting to look specifically at the Flemish school because we know that in the Flemish strain, they actively kept up relations with the Dutch Republic and with Mennonites in the Netherlands, printing their own Dutch language Bibles and uh, other religious literature, as well as inviting over speakers from the Dutch Republic uh, to be able to keep the links with the Netherlands alive, even as Dutch culture in other areas was fading because there were no new immigrants arriving following the end of the 17th century. These Mennonites living in Gdańsk kept up connections with the Netherlands by sending their sons back to places such as Amsterdam to receive their education, both vocationally and indeed religiously. And as mentioned, religious literature would be published in the Netherlands in Dutch for the congregation, meaning that the Dutch language was kept alive because they had to be able to read their own scriptures and their prayer books that they were bringing over. It wasn't all just religious though. Ambrose Vermole or Vermole, likely coming from Flanders, came over in 1598 and invented the Goldwasser vodka, which is a particular kind of vodka found in Dinsk, which includes many herbs and spices added to the flavor as we still have the original recipe. But what gives it its name are the very thin slivers of gold that do not alter the taste in any way, but means that when the vodka is poured, it shines like Gold. If ever there was a symbol of the decadence and the prosperity of Dutch trade in the 17th century, then this would probably be it. Vodka mixed with all the herbs and spices of the East that was made to look like gold. However, from the name, we can already guess that this is a German name, Goldwasser. Whether it was called Goldwater and later became called Goldwasser isn't entirely clear. But the fact that the distillery in which it was made was known as Der Lachs, meaning the salmon in German, suggests that the German language was by far the most important one in Gdańsk at this time, rather than the Dutch language. And so we have a little insight into the linguistic situation within the city. We know that for the Mennonites, at least Dutch was the main language being used until about 1750, after which time we start to see a change from Dutch being replaced by several other languages, in particular High German, which had already replaced Low German as the official uh, language of the city in its administration. However, being spoken among the Mennonites themselves, it's likely there was some kind of Plautdeutsch or amalgamation of various Low German dialects that would replace Dutch and Frisian and any other languages being spoken by the Mennonites around the middle of the 18th century. However, the departure from the Dutch language wouldn't necessarily be an easy switch as Mennonites in particular are fond of tradition and doing things the old way. We know, for example, that in 1762, when it was proposed to change the prayer book from the Dutch language prayer book to the German language prayer book, that there were riots in the Mennonite church until the decision was reversed. However, by 1780, we know that really Dutch was on the way out, as it was in this year that the hymn books, which had up until then been in Dutch, were replaced with high German hymn books. And it seems that by around the start of the 19th century, Dutch had likely disappeared from the streets of Gdańsk and its Mennonite communities. Part of this switch from Dutch to German likely came as a result of the 1772 partition of Poland, which meant that this area of Gdańsk, which had been ruled over by the kings of Poland, became a part of the Prussian Empire and later the German Empire. As a result of this, it seems that German would receive a much higher status than Dutch would ever have in the city, and so many people switched to speaking German rather than Dutch. The vast majority, of course, of the inhabitants of Gdańsk being German-speaking anyway. In 1919, however, following the defeat of Germany and the Central Powers in the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles would decide what would happen with the borders of Europe, major changes being made, of course, in Central and Eastern Europe, and the fate of Dinsk would be particularly important for later European history. It was decided at the Treaty of Versailles that a new Polish state would be created. However, the city of Gdańsk, with its 
its vast majority of German speakers would form a somewhat limbo entity that was officially a part of the Kingdom of Poland. It was responsible for its military situation. However, it would be an international free city, the free city of Danzig. This would be particularly important for the later development of the city. Dansk had shared its currency with Germany. It decided to go its own way and to create its own currency, which they named the Gulden or Gulden, which was actually the same currency as was being used in the Netherlands, although a different variety of it, such as you have Canadian dollars and American dollars. But we do see on the design of these Gulden that they did indeed uh, base it on several of these Dutch currencies of the past and indeed which were still being used in the Netherlands and the money was actually minted in the Netherlands and Germany and then sent to Gdańsk. Around this time, we're not entirely clear how many Polish-speaking people or Poles there were in the city of Gdańsk. Some estimates put it to 10 to 15 percent, rising to 20 percent at the end of the 1930s, while other estimates put the figure far lower, at as low as 1 percent. The truth is probably somewhere in between. Up to around a third of the city were perhaps Polish-speaking at this point. Of course, in 1939, things were take a dark turn in Europe. The city of Gdańsk, or Danzig as it was being called by the majority of its inhabitants, would vote overwhelmingly in favour of a national socialist government. Although the Treaty of Versailles forbade it from joining together with Germany, this was indeed what most people in the city wanted to do. Just by looking at the flag of the police service, we can see the way in which the uh, the city was going and that the police were indeed far from neutral. And it would be in Gdańsk on the 1st of September 1939 that the Second World War in Europe would begin in earnest, with a German assault lasting several days, capturing the city and the small Polish garrison on the Westerplatte the police having helped the German invading army to capture the city from the Polish army garrison there. The city's population would suffer many hardships during the war, but by 1945, with the retreat of the Eastern Front and the oncoming Soviets, a large majority of the German-speaking inhabitants of the city decided to flee to the West in the face of the coming Soviet onslaught, thus largely emptying the city. It was decided at the Potsdam Conference that this part of Gdańsk would indeed belong to Poland and so that it would be split from Germany and that as part of that split the German ethnically German inhabitants had to be removed from the city and sent to Germany proper to its new boundaries and so following the Soviet occupation of Poland the remaining German population were often terribly mistreated just as the Poles had been by the Germans before and were were all sent packing back to Germany, even though many of them had lived there for centuries. Of course, no one at that time, following the horrors of the Second World War, was in a mood for a more nuanced view of the city and the times, and it was felt by the indeed the Allies and the Soviets that having a largely German-speaking city inside the borders of Poland was a recipe for another war, and so the decision was taken to empty the city. In 1945, there were around 124,000 inhabitants, which dwindled to 8,000 following the removal of the German-speaking population. This Potsdam conference would not only decide the fate of the German-speaking population in what would become Poland, but also many Polish-speaking people in what had been Poland but was now annexed to the USSR, Poland's borders essentially moving to the west, incorporating parts of Poison, parts that had been Germany, and losing many parts that today form part of the Baltic countries and Ukraine. Many of those Polish people that were removed forcibly from their homes in these eastern parts now needed a new place to settle, and many of them came to the ruined city of Gdańsk. Gdańsk had been completely destroyed during the war. Around 90% of its old beautiful architecture lay in absolute ruins as a result of both British bombing, the British viewing this as an enemy German city rather than an occupied Polish city, 
uh, as well as the Soviet attack that had ultimately taken the city from German hands. And so all of these hundreds of thousands of refugees coming from across Poland were now sheltering in the bombed out ruins of what had once been a city. There therefore came a conundrum, because all these people needed houses before the winter set in. And yet this was an absolute jewel on the Baltic. And so many people thought that perhaps it would be better just to build Soviet-style concrete blocks to house as many people as efficiently as possible, rather than to do the painstaking work of reconstruction and repairing what had been an amazingly beautiful city before. There was also, of course, the attitude that this had been a German city that had been built by Germans that had voted in the National Socialists and indeed had helped the Germans to capture the city and then to inflict terrible suffering upon its Polish and several of its other minority communities. Communities. There was therefore this idea after the war that this city should not be rebuilt, that this should become a colourless, a dull city in communist style with the same blocks that would spring up throughout Europe, Eastern Europe rather than the old style of these narrow, tall houses that had been seen before. This was summed up by Edmund Osmianczyk, who said that we are not going to cry over ashes. We won't rebuild these reminders of the Teutonic Knights and the power they once wielded. We don't want to remember. We will build in the Polish style, not that of the Teutonic invaders. Now, of course, the Polish style in other places, if you visit the old town of Warsaw or Krakow, can be incredibly beautiful. But that wasn't what was being requested for the new city of Gdańsk following 1945. However, in the end, a compromise was struck in 1948, which thankfully saw the return of many of the amazing architectural wonders of the city of Gdańsk as it had been before the war and that you can still see today. There is a slight house of cards element that many of the old facades were painstakingly reconstructed, but the interiors are essentially communal living blocks, as can be found in many other communist era sites. However, at least on the outside, it remains an incredibly beautiful city, and work is still being done to return some of its areas to their former glory to this day. Some of it has been changed, however. Some of the writing that was found on many of the buildings and decorations have been changed from their original German to Polish to reflect the new ownership of the city and the new population, which is now overwhelmingly Polish inside the city. The work was done by looking at old uh, charts and maps and diagrams of the city before the Germans had taken it. Some of these go back quite a long time into the past, indeed the 17th century and the 18th century, when there were even more of these Dutch and Flemish style buildings in the city before they were changed into more German style housing by the later 19th century population. That's why the city of Gdańsk now may actually look a little bit more Dutch than it did originally before the Second World War as when stylistic choices had to be made, the renovating architects decided to go for the more Dutch and Flemish looking designs than the German looking designs because of the post-war spirit of the 1940s. However, I think you'll agree that they did an amazing job. Considering that 90% of this amazing city lay in rubble in the end of 1945, I think we can all agree that Gdańsk is once again a beautiful city that is well worth visiting. Well, today I've talked a lot about the Dutch influence in the city of Gdańsk, particularly in terms of its trade, architecture, language and Mennonite community. What's nice about visiting it today is that you can see the influence of various cultures that have been important in its history. Not only the Dutch and Flemish, but of course also the Germans, who for a large part built up the city to what it is today, and indeed also the Poles, who for a long time were a minority in the city, but an important one nonetheless, and who painstakingly rebuilt the city following the devastation of the Second World War and today have made it their own.
I think you'll agree that it is a uh, wonderful thing to see that they have restored the city to its former glory, and I greatly enjoyed walking around Gdańsk with my girlfriend to encounter some of these uh, bits of history that can still be found today. But anyway, that is all I have time for today. This has been my take on the Dutch and Flemish connections with the city of Gdańsk or Danzig in German or rather fun in Dutch as I found out it used to be called Danswijk which for those of you who don't speak Dutch sounds an awful lot like dancing neighborhood. But anyway that was today's video on the Dutch and Flemish in Gdańsk in the north of Poland. Let me know if you enjoyed this video. If you did and you haven't seen my video about the Olenje or the Dutch population that moved to rural Poland, there is some overlap with this video there, but I think enough distinction that it is worth watching as well. There'll be a link in the description below to go and watch that one should you be interested. Many thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know anything in the comments below and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Until then, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History. Do widzenia.